Hello and welcome to my session one Old Testament storyboard video. So in Genesis 1 through 3, we see this is the primal history according to Wright 2019. The primal history because it's things that happened in history before dated history, before we have recorded dated history. Now, when we look at who God is and, and what Genesis 1 through 3 reveals about who God is, we see that God is the creator that he created the heavens, the earth, and life. But we also see that God was outside of time and space and matter as he created those things. We see that God is sovereign, that he is all-powerful, that he can just merely speak things into existence. They happen because he says them. Now what we learn about humans in Genesis 1 through 3 is we learn that humans were created by God's hand. Everything else God spoke into existence. But with humans, he took the time to mold them with his hands and form them in his own likeness and own image. We see that humans have dominion or authority. Not to be confused with control. Um, but they are given authority or dominion over creatures on earth. But we also see that with that authority or power comes responsibility. Things that humans are supposed to do and not supposed to do. For instance, Adam was asked to name all of the animals. It was left to, it was left to Adam to name the animals. He had a responsibility. He also was told not to eat from the tree of knowledge. He could eat any other fruit, but not from the tree of knowledge. So we see here that God gives a list of do's and don'ts or responsibilities that came with the authority or power he had given humans. We also see in Genesis 1 through, through 3 that humans are fallible. That um, they can be disobedient to God, which also shows that they have free will. That God gave them free will. Because we see that God speaks and things happen. I mean, very easily God could have spoke man into obedience. But he gave man free will and the, the ability to choose for himself. We also see that humans can be misled by voices other than God's. With the, with the example of the serpent with Eve and also then Eve unto Adam. We see here that uh, humans... Well, let's, go, let's move on to human interaction. I think I'm getting into some of my next points here. <laughs> so when it comes to human interaction and what we learn about human interaction in Genesis 1 through 3, we do see the tendency of humans to follow those close to them. That we are prone to do wrong when those closest to us are doing wrong. We are more likely to go along with that. We see that humans can be misled, like we discussed by Voices Other Than Gods, with the example of the serpent. We see a tendency for humans to hide when they feel shame. And when they hid from God, when they realized they were naked and it felt shame. They hid from God. Um, let's see here. We also see that human and, and human interaction we see a conflict between the serpent and humans we see uh, anonymity or adversity or strife between a struggle between the two as God declares now when it comes to the world what we learn about the world in Genesis 1 through 3 we see that the world was first of all created by God that um, it houses or homes the living creatures that God created for the earth, including humans. We see that God chose to divide the night and the day, or the light and the dark, and call them day and night. We see that God has divided land and water, so that we have areas covered in water and areas of land. We see that the land offers adversity or affliction to humans. And, and the idea that uh, men must toil over the soil and slave to produce crops to eat. But we'll come back to that later. Now, when it comes to crea the creation interacting with the creator, what we learn, we learn several things. We learn that everything is under God's authority. Even humans who were given dominion and free will and power and authority are still subject to the authority and the control of God. Uh, and we'll come, we'll, well, no, we'll cover that now, actually. So, 
we see this uh, present itself in the Creator's justice, and we and we get a huge understanding as to who God is on how He interacts with humans and responds to their sin, and in the form of justness, this the justice, this kind of a fitting punishment for the crime, so to speak. Because we see human abuse their free will and their authority to be disobedient in sin and eat from the tree of knowledge when they could have eaten anything else. And at this time, human had dominion over the earth, over the living creatures, the plants and the animals. But now we see that God in his justice forces human to slave over the earth in order to eat since they were disobedient in eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge. So we see this kind of uh, cosmic justice play out. Now when it comes to the problem of sin, we know that humans are fallible and that sin has consequence. We learn that in Genesis 1 through 3. And some of the consequences, like we mentioned, was working the earth to be able to eat. Uh, but there's also consequences of, of childbirth. And then the, the ultimate consequence of pain and death. As we know that the New Testament does tell us that the wages of sin are death. Now also we see here though that sin causes shame. Because before sin entered into man and woman, they knew no shame. And we also see that that shame causes people to hide from God or to avoid relation with God. And I mean, and that's very important in, in the whole storyline of the Old and New Testament. Now, when it comes to the solution to sin, on the surface, it seems that obedience, <laughs> simple obedience would be the solution to sin. Because sin is simply disobedience to God. But we have learned that human is fallible. So, that's really not going to work, is it? So, in this session's Lecture 3, we are taught to look at a verse in context and a passage in context of the book, but also in the greater context of the whole story of the Bible. And in order to find a solution to sin, that's what we're going to have to do here. Because in Genesis 3.15, we talk about the bruising of the head of the serpent by humans and the bruising of the heel, heel of human by the serpent. Now, that alone, I mean, that's just a clue. That alone doesn't talk, tell us about the solution, so to speak. But when we go to, well, if we jump to the New Testament, to Revelation 12, 11, we are told that we overcome our adversary by the blood of the Lamb. Now, it's not just the blood of the Lamb. It's also the word of our testimony and loving not our own lives, we, we, you know, even unto death. But that's going to kind of detour us from, from the purpose of this assignment. So, we're going to stay away from that. but And now we, we could argue, well, who is, who is the Lamb that we speak of? The blood of the Lamb. Well, John 1.29 tells us when John the Baptist uh, declares that Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So, I mean, and there's tons of evidence all throughout the Old Testament and New Testament. I mean, so much evidence we couldn't cover it all in this video. But it, it goes to show... Uh, that that's what Genesis 3.15 was potentially alluding to. Now, if we move on to Genesis 12, chapters 1 through 3, um, we're going to cover the promises that God made Abraham and why they're significant. Okay, and those three promises were land and offspring or children, so many in fact to create a nation, and the blessing, saying that God would bless Abraham he would bless those who blessed him and curse those who dishonored him. And that the whole world and all peoples would be blessed through Abraham. So we're going we're gonna to start with the promise of land. The land that was promised to Abraham. So why is that land significant? Well, it's significant mainly because of almost all of our Old Testament and New Testament stories take place in that land. All, I mean, the whole setting for the whole story. I mean, it's, it's the setting for the story that's played out, the timeless story. So, without that land, 
we wouldn't have the setting that we see throughout throughout the Old and New Testament. I mean, it's the same land that David slayed Goliath on, that um, the Israelites moved into after the Exodus. It's the same. It's the same land that Christ was crucified on. You know, I mean, so it's very, very significant in, in the story overall. Now, moving on to the, the promise of the offspring or the people or, or the nation that, that God would create. It's, it's very significant because God would use that nation to show man's fallibility once again and his need for salvation. But he would also uh, use it to show his law, which helped to show that man was incapable of fulfilling the law. And needed salvation, but also he would use that nation and that bloodline to offer salvation to the entire world and offer himself into the entire world. So that's very, very significant as the story plays out. Now, if we move on to the promise of the blessing, we see that God promises to make Abraham's name great so that he would be a blessing to others. We see that God is going to bless those who bless him and curse those who dishonor him. And we see that played out uh, all throughout the Bible, throughout history. I mean, nobody was allowed to rise up against Israel successfully unless God allowed it to, as a consequence to the Israelites for disobeying God and refusing to repent. Um, and we see it with the Egyptians, you know. Um, they dishonored uh, the ancestor or the descendants of Abraham. And just by dishonoring his ancestors, I mean his descendants, forgive me, uh, we see that he wreaks havoc on Egypt when they refuse to let them go. When they finally do, uh, then he wipes out their army when they come after him, after them. Uh, we see the ten plagues, and we see the ten plagues is showing that none of their gods have power. They're all powerless compared to the one and true living God. You know, he attacked every element of every god and, and, and their whole belief system. Um, but anyway, that's getting a little off topic. But so um, we also see that all of the people would be blessed through Abram. Well, we see that through the promise of Christ and salvation. So uh, moving on to the promises continued throughout the Old Testament. In Exodus 7, 14 through 11 and 10, we, we, were, talking, we were just talking about this, the 10 plagues of Egypt. And, and their gods being powerless and them being cursed because they cursed or dishonored the descendants of Abraham. But we also see that Egypt is a powerhouse at this time, you know. But we see that shortly after this, Egypt almost plays no significant role in, in history. They lose their power, their significance. We see them, uh, you know, uh, no longer a powerhouse. They lose the power they had. You know, so I think that's a clear-cut example of Cursing those who dishonor Abraham and even his descendants. Now in uh, Psalms 114, we see that the promised land is celebrated with just a beautiful song about the Israelites occupying the promised land after the Exodus. So that's a, that's a great example of that being that, that promise of the land carried out throughout the Old Testament. And uh, Isaiah 11.10, we see another example of the blessing here uh, through the promise of Christ when he refers to the root of Jesse. And, uh, but we're going we're gonna to move on to Isaiah 11, 11 and 12, where it talks about all of the people or all of the children of Abraham being gathered back together, you know, uh, so that we've covered then the three promises there. Um, Moving, moving on here, we're going to talk about why it's important to see the Old Testament as an unfolding story. And number one is it shows our fallen nature. It shows our need for salvation. It shows God's love for us. And it shows his promise to restore our broken relationship through salvation and through Messiah. Now, in conclusion... It's important to recognize the narrative flow of the Bible as a whole because without knowing about our fallen nature, our need for salvation, without knowing God's love for us and his promise to restore that broken relationship, we can never truly understand the 
significance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want to go ahead and, and, and cite my sources here and give credit where credit is due. Uh, my first source is Colorado Christian University, accessed in 2022. It would be our Session 1, Lecture 3 for uh, Bible 101A, and that can be found on blackboard.ccu.edu. My second source is, of course, the Holy Bible English Standard Version, uh, published in 2001 by Crossway. And my third and final source for this assignment will be Wright CJH, published in 2019, The Old Testament in Seven Sentences, A Small Introduction to a Vast Topic, published by InterVarsity Press. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this presentation.